It's Sunday night, and we are in a study on the doctrine of the devil. The whole idea of the devil's doctrine is to allow man to have what he wants in the flesh. That's the whole idea, is to allow you to have what you want. Now, that's the easiest message to want to get a hold of, whatever will fulfill your flesh. In fact, when Eve was in the garden, the first message that, that Satan brought, he deceived Eve when he said to her, Hath God said, he just simply put in question God's commandment, Thou shalt not. He said, Did God say you couldn't eat of any tree of the garden? What he did when he said that, he twisted Eve's mind. He twisted we're talking about how minds in America twisted. That is what it's about. And he did that so she would partake of the tree. And what was in the tree, John says, is all that's in the world, in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And Eve saw a tree that's good for food, it's pleasant to the eye, and it would make her wise. That is what, in, it was the lust of the eye, pride of, of the eye, pleasant to the eye, the lust of the flesh is good for food. It would make her a wise person. So what Satan wanted her to do was eat of the tree, and that is things and stuff. Things and the stuff of this world. That is nothing but what tempts the lust of the flesh, lust of flesh. When man gets an overwhelming desire to fulfill his flesh, he twists the Word of God. He doesn't remove the Word of God. He simply twists it. Now, I believe that America is under an assault of men who are twisting words throughout our entire society. People are acting. Now, I'm going to give you some list of things that they're doing in America and they're saying in America because they're saying uh, that they have twisted words to make them mean something they don't mean so they can have their way. People are acting good. The Bible says there's none good, there's none righteous, and that all men drink iniquity like water. Their goodness comes from being brainwashed that they think they're good. They're being told, if you'll tell America you're good, you deserve these things, you're a good person, People will get to thinking that. I believe America's brainwashed and that there's mind control and manipulation in America. Everyone, and here's some of the things that people say. Everyone should love and have affection to everybody. Then they'll say, the Bible says so, that you're supposed to love your neighbor, love your enemy. And what they do, they do not go back into into the definition of words, and they have no idea what love means. When the Bible says, love your enemy, love your neighbor, God is love, most people don't even know what the word love means. And of course, we've said this a thousand times here. We have taken the words, two words, agape and phileo, and phileo, and the world has tried to make love your enemy, love your neighbor, uh, God is love, they've all made it phileo, and it is never phileo, it's always agape. Now this is twisting the word of God like Satan did over here. We've been using the theme verse in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, that in the latter time some shall depart from faith. Well, faith is death to self. It is taking your cross and dying daily. It's obedience to God and not not obeying the flesh and not wanting to fulfill the flesh. They're twisting the Word of God. They're leaving the Word of God in their daily life and leaving it in the message. But they're saying, God is phileo. Well, phileo means affection or to like. And what they do not do is they, they do not define these words. Well, Affection, or to like something, you can like anything. You can have an affection for anything. Well, that's what phileo means. I like cake. I like my dog. I like my wife. I like God. I like to drink. I like to take drugs. You can like anything. Uh, but agape, it has to do with a liking someone so much that you're willing to obey them. 
That's what agape is. 2 John 6. 2 John 6 says, This is love. This is love. Well, if you, if you define it with phileo, phileo, which you also get the word philia. Philia is the word friend. Now, Jesus said, and the Scripture says, if we're friends with the world, or if we have an affection for the world, then we're enemies of God. So what the Bible's talking about when it says God is love, is talking about God is His own commandments, His own law, and what He does when He writes His law and fleshy tables of our hearts, He doesn't just expect us to obey it, He's going to cause us to obey His laws, and that's the same thing as agape. If you told your mother you loved her and every time she'd come in the room you'd kick her in the shin or throw something at her or she told you to make up your bed and you're a little kid and you throw all your stuff in the floor and jump up and down on it, does that look like love? No. And whenever God tells us to walk in His commandments and we say, well, I like God, but I don't do the things I want. Well, that's not, li- that's not even liking God. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do the things that I say. What He is saying I'll only have affection for you if you keep my agape and obey my laws. But otherwise, I have no affection for you if you don't agape me and agape your enemy. Agape your enemy, or agapao is the verb form. Agapao. Agapao your enemy means to walk in the commandments of God concerning your enemy. And the commandments are not just the Ten Commandments. It's every time you have an imperative mood in the Greek, <coughs> every time you have an imperative mood, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Well, here's the word akuo, and obey is the word hoop akuo. So, hear means to, when you obey God, you hear under or you're subordinate to God. So, hear and obey are your basic same word. Obey just means to where you hear, you hear under, or you understand and you're obedient, or you're subordinate to God because you hear His words. So, what men have done, if you notice something, you know what they haven't done? Put any details in definition. There's just no details. There's really no meaning to the English language. In English language, I keep saying it's a harlot language. It sells out meanings. It's a very crude, barbaric language is what it is. Because you got so many words in it that don't mean anything. When the Bible says, love your neighbor, love your enemy, God is love, it's talking about walking the commandments of God concerning God, your enemies, and your neighbor. Now that's what it's talking about. Now, let me read some other things here. The Bible, or people will say, Smile. It's not as bad as you... It's not that bad. Has anybody ever been told that? Smile is not that bad. It's, you don't... See, that is a brainwashing that people have said throughout the world. Smile is not that bad, and you're tell, you might be telling somebody whose mother just died. You might be telling somebody who just found out their daughter has cancer. You might be talking to somebody who just lost their house. You might be talking to somebody whose wife just left them. What do you mean it's not that bad? That's real easy for you to say when you don't know their shoes. Instead of saying, smile, it's not that bad, people want you to go around smiling when you don't feel like smiling. That's very foolish. That's the same thing they'll do in a real estate company. They say, always be positive. That's a brainwashing, isn't it? Positive means be phony, smile when you don't feel like it, smile when everything is downhill. I said it this morning to somebody walking out of the church. I said, how are you? I said, are you, you ever get depressed? They said, well, I, we shouldn't be. I said, yes, we should. Paul got depressed, didn't he? Paul said, I was pressed out of measure. I despaired of life. If you get depressed, you're in good company. Do you think Jesus was on the cross saying, uh, zippity doo da? Is that what you think he's doing? Singing zippity doo da? And he's up there, or Paul's being thrown over. He's running for his life, and he's singing singing some song, and he's skipping through the clover. They were depressed. Paul said, I was pressed out of measure. He said, I despaired of life. Despaired of life is the word exoporiomai. It means I was in a quandary. I was very out of my mind, and I felt like there's no way out. 
that God brought me at. Where did people ever come up with the idea that we're all supposed to be smiley-faced? Everybody here gets depressed, don't you? Everybody gets depressed. Well, aren't you supposed to be? Look what Paul said over here in 2 Corinthians. Just look at what he said. And you know, these words are astonishing to people when Paul says these. Look here in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. First chapter is what Paul is saying. He says in verse 3, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Now, what's he going to comfort us for if we're not down and out? If you're at a picnic all day long, do you need comfort? You don't go down to the Starlight Club and comfort guys that are dancing across the dance floor with somebody else's wife. You don't run over there and grab them, put your arm around them and say, there, there, it's going to be okay. You don't do that, do you? No. Then who is it that needs comfort? We need comfort. Parakaleo. Parakaleo comes from kaleo. It means call. That's part of the word. It's part of the word uh, ecclesia, which is the word the called out. Ekkaleo. Well, this means to call near. Para means near. It's our word parallel. To call near or comfort someone who is mourning over sin or problems in their life and their believers, we're supposed to be comforting them. We, if, if they weren't depressed, we wouldn't be comforting them. And sometimes all of us get depressed. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Paul said that when he was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. The reason they left him for dead is he looked dead when they left him. How in the world could you be here he is preaching at Lystra, which is right in the middle of what we call Turkey. And the Pharisees have left Antioch, come over to Iconium, had him run out of Iconium. They ran him out of Antioch, run him out of Iconium. He goes down to Lystra. The same Pharisees get the, get the guys up here at Iconium to come down there. And they take Paul outside the city, throw him off of some precipice in all probability. And then they start throwing these big... 25, 30 pound stones on him and he gets all busted up. You think he got up and sang, started singing uh, Amen, Amen, Amen. You think he was feeling good about that time? They didn't feel good. They were depressed. You're supposed to get depressed and what we do is comfort each other. That's why we need the fellowship because we're out here preaching predestination is true and Christmas is pagan. The world is brainwashed with all of this, this rhetoric, these cliches that men come up with, whatever rhetoric is, <laughs> whatever cliches are. And that's what it is, isn't it? It's just common sayings that men say every day. You're not supposed to feel bad. You're supposed to be happy all the time. I'm going to show you how people are brainwashed. They tell you in real estate school, always be positive. I mean, I was in real estate, and I was always realistic, and I made fun of that. I made fun of real estate agents who were, who were, it always bugged me whenever said write out some ad in a paper, and they'd put beautiful flowing view from the front picture window. As you look out through the scenic skyline, I'm going, oh, good grief. And they put these flowing, smooth, pretty words, and usually when I'd be out showing a house, I'd walk into a living room and I'd go, here's a room. And people would go, <laughs> they'd start laughing. They'd say, what are you doing? I said, I'm making fun of real estate agents that try to paint something here that's not here. Can you see this? And they'd say, yeah, and they'd laugh. And they'd see that I was kind of putting other real estate agents on because they go in there and they memorize flowing sentences to sound like... Uh, R.C. Sproul, I guess, with all of his big $20 words, you know. And they would tell you, be positive all the time. Well, when we had a big recession hit in 1982, if you go into another company, they're supposed to say, if you say, how's things in here? They'll say, great, you know. Yeah, phony. But I didn't ask them how things were going. I would go into their office and I'd say, 
Y'all are as dead as we are, aren't you? And they'd say, yeah, it's kind of tough. But if I said, how are you doing? They'd say, great. That's a con. Don't you know that by now? That's phony. That's what Tony Robbins tell you, and that's what Kenneth Copeland say positive things, and it'll create positive in your life. You know there's not any difference between Kenneth Copeland and Tony Robbins except Kenneth Copeland and Fred Price and those guys. They're doing it in the name of Jesus and conning people. So I used to do that to them. I said, y'all are dead like us. And they'd say, yeah, it is. They're supposed to tell me things are great, even when there was no sales whatsoever going on. It's, do you not know the world is being conned? And you're being conned? Be realistic. Look here. Do you actually think, when he goes on, Paul goes on to say, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth in Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation. I'm being afflicted by the world. He put it this way in the fourth chapter. He said, Death works in us, so life will come alive in you. <clears throat> and he says, It is for your consolation. We're suffering for your consolation. So you can be consoled and be comforted. Why is he saying these things if he's not suffering? And salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Look at all these words. Suffer, consolation, comfort, consoling people. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be of the consolation. Consolation is the word paraclesis. P-A-R-A-K-L-E-S-I-S. -E and the Bible tells us in Romans, the 15th chapter, that the Word of God is our comfort. That's what comforts us. And the Holy Spirit is the comforter, the P-A-R-A-K-L-O-T-E-S. Paracletos and paracletes, L-A-T-E-S. Paracletes and the paracletes, that is the Holy Spirit, and that comes from Kaleo. So if the Holy Spirit is our comforter, what is it comforting for if we're not depressed sometimes? Huh? What do you think comfort is for? It's in your depression. <coughs> Jesus wasn't shouting for joy. When we shout for joy, remember when we shout for joy? Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and they reproach you and separate from your company and cast out your name as evil in Luke 6.22. Rejoice and leap for joy. That's when you leap for joy. It's when you feel miserable. You know what this message is that we preach? It's the most wonderful, miserable message that you can have. It's a wonderful, miserable message in the flesh. It's supposed to discomfort you. Don't listen to the world when they say, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to always be happy. That's a bunch of baloney. If you're a Christian, the majority of time in the world, <coughs> you're supposed to be persecuted and unhappy, but you're happy in Christ when you get together with the people of God. That's common. Anything that you feel is common. It's supposed to be that way. Is anybody ever here get real miserable and real depressed? Well, Sheldon's first one goes up. Because he came up one night and he said, I get depressed. Is, is that something wrong with me? I said, no, you're supposed to be depressed. And he goes on to say, in verse 8, <laughs> we, wouldn't have not, we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble... Thalipsis, same word as tribulation. In the world you shall have tribulation, John 16, 33. That's Jesus' words. Which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure. That word pressed out of measure is bareo. B-A-R-E-O. That means a burden, burden that's so heavy you can't hardly bear it. Has anybody felt that way? With Paul... If Paul had this problem, the world says you're always supposed to be smiling and happy as Christians. No, you're not. Whoever, if you were supposed to be, do you think God could make you happy 24 hours a day? Is everybody happy 24 hours a day? Does everybody feel good 24 hours a day? Nobody that's a true believer does. Paul says, I was pressed out of measure above the strength that I had. I couldn't bear it. Then he says, and 
insomuch that we despaired even of life. He said, this weight was so heavy on me that I exoporiumai to be utterly at a loss, despondent in despair. Exoporiumai. Exoporiumai, right there. That's that word right there. He said, the burden was so heavy on me, I couldn't get out of it. Now, this con that the world's putting on us, don't believe them. Learn to think for yourself. America doesn't think. Somebody put that in their minds, and they're spreading all this garbage throughout the world. We're happy together. Happy are we when men persecute you for righteousness' sake. We're happy or we're blessed when we go through all these trials knowing this is the will of God. Don't listen to the world. They say you're supposed to feel good all the time. That's hooey. It's not true. Do you think you're going to feel good when you look at, he says, who delivered us from so great a death? He said, I was at death's door. People were trying to kill me constantly. If somebody put a contract out on your life, you had to look every time you went out the door and hide behind walls and, and sneak around in your car and look around constantly before you went in the house and run in the house. Did you know Paul had to do that all the time? Do you think he was really just super happy? That's an American con in the world saying you're supposed to be just silly, goofy looking happy. Look like a Stepford wife. That's what you're supposed to be. No, that's not true. And you look at chapter 4. Does this sound like a person that's constantly happy? Are we happy? Yes, but we're happy when we're persecuted. We're happy when we're with, when we're with each other. And we are, in a sense, happy out there in the world where the world's crucifying us and hating us and calling us names and using epithets. I'm cussed and cursed of all, all kinds of phone calls and people writing emails and writing letters, cussing me to beat the band. Do you think that makes me feel good? I get to where I laugh at it. But sometimes what bothers me more than anything else is the world calling itself Christian and they don't believe God. It's not the... The thing that depresses me is not what people do to me. The thing that depresses me is the world that calls itself Christian and it does not believe God. Do I get depressed? Yes, I go through two and three weeks at a time in a state of depression. But I know it'll go away. So you know what I do? I keep going. You're not any different than I am. I know that. And if you're pastoring, it's pretty, it's pretty depressing when people want to kill you and they hate you simply because you tell them the truth. Look here in chapter 4. In verse 8, we are troubled. Philebo, same word as narrow is the way. In Matthew 7, 13, narrow is the way. That word trouble is the same word as narrow. It means to be pressured on all sides. Does this sound like what the world is saying? We are perplexed, but not in despair. That word despair is the word exoporiomai. Same word as Paul used over there in the first chapter when he said, I despaired of life. He says, persecuted, but not forsaken. We're persecuted. Do you think you're supposed to be running around with a smile on your face while people are persecuting you because you tell them Christmas is pagan and predestination is true and they want to sneer at you and snarl and, and call you a name so you're in a cult? you think you're supposed to feel good about that? Just sit back and say, okay, and walk away. It doesn't feel good to have your friends and family say things to you when they didn't used to say these things before you got involved in this truth. Persecuted but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. We're cast down by the world. Don't listen to their words that you're not supposed to feel bad. You are, but where you get strength is in fellowship, don't you? Especially when we walk up and say, my mother said this, my brother said this, my sister said this, and they're calling me a cult. And they're saying, I've fallen some guy off into, and I'm going to go to hell believing this stuff. Is that depressing? Well, sure it is. It's supposed to. Doesn't everybody here go through it? The world has been brainwashed telling you you're not supposed to be depressed, and that's not true. He says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. In our bodies, we're dying daily. Paul said, I die daily. Is dying, is that a real intense thing? One young girl came here with her father and said, boy, he sure is intense. I think daily cross death to self, self-denial is intense, isn't it? Somebody nailing you to a cross, is that not intense? 
Yes, it is. And I'm talking about figuratively. He says, always bearing about in the dying the Lord of the Lord Jesus, the life that also the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. He said, Christ is manifest in us, but we're dying for you. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. You think that's supposed to be happy, smiley faced all the time? That's not what our lives are supposed to be. We're supposed to say truth and we're supposed to be persecuted for it and it's supposed to make us sad because our friends and loved ones don't want it. It's not like when your friends start persecuting you, you're like, well, I feel like I'm at the... I feel like I'm at the zoo. I feel like I'm at the fair. I'm riding the rides. You don't know. That's not what you feel. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death works in us so that life will work in you, Corinthians. I'm dying daily and being persecuted, running for my life so that you can come to truth. That's pretty heavy. And he says down here in verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory, while we look at the things which are seen, while we look not at the things that are seen, we don't look around us, but at the things which are not seen. We know our hope is in Christ. For the things which are seen are temporary. It's just temporal. It's temporary. It's not here for long. But the things which are seen... But the things, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And we're looking at eternal things. And look back here in Romans. Romans, the sixth chapter. Paul says, he says a similar verse in verse 18 of chapter, excuse me, chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And he says, we are to, in verse chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it to the lust thereof. So if we're living this way and living godly and righteously, you think this is happy, time for happiness all the time? The happiest I am is what I gather together with the people of God when I'm talking to you on the phone, when I'm with you and I know that you're with me and we're strong, we're strong toward each other every day. Let me read some more things that I've written down here. The Bible in the English translation, after misinterpreting love in some other words, for the last 50 or 60 years seems to say that because the majority of America is saying it over and over for 60 years that this is the truth. That's not true. America does not think for themselves. I've got a book over here. It's about brainwashing. It's about, it's called mind manipulation. And I, I'm not going to be able to read out much out of it tonight. If I get back to it, I will. But it's the Age of Manipulation, this is by Wilson Brian Key, Ph.D. He says the world is being manipulated and people think they have free will and you're being manipulated every day and nobody has free will. He said the things that we do and the actions that we do are things that are put in our minds. When people say stuff over and over and over, it's, that is brainwashing. It is mind control, mind manipulation. And America is living under that that message, mind manipulation. One of the most, one of the worst questions that's asked, especially in Sunday school classes across America, is somebody reads a verse and they say, what does that mean to you? That has nothing to do with what does that mean to you. It is what does it mean according to the first century culture and custom, and all the world is saying, the Bible means something different to everybody. No, it doesn't. That's mind manipulation. That is mind control. That's brainwashing. How many times have we all heard that? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything to an individual other than its original meaning. Whew. Aren't we living in a crazy world? You know what, America, you've heard the old saying, if it's too good to be true, it is. 
America is too good to be true. All these people I have seen, I've been in business. I've seen people smiley face when they got their business and they love you to death when you're a client of theirs. They always like you. When I go out to restaurants, I always give give waiters and waitresses, I give them a DVD and I'll say a few words like God doesn't love everybody and they'll and they'll say, yes, sir, well, thank you, sir. Well, they think they're going to get a tip from me. They're not going to be able to say what they want to say because the rules of the company won't let them, but they get back behind the scenes. Dan used to be a waiter over here at, at uh, Cheddar's, and he said, and I'd give some of the waitress, thank you, sir, I'll listen to this. And he said they'd get together there and say, that guy's a nut. So you're going to be called a nut behind your back. You're going to be called crazy. While you're the client, they're going to treat you good. And when you're not around, they're not. They don't mean, most of the world doesn't mean what they say to you. Used car salesmen, insurance salesmen, real estate agents do not mean the niceness that comes off their lips. I have watched real estate agents, smiley face. This is all brainwashing. And they're told to be smiley face and be positive about everything that's going on. And then behind the scenes, they're messing around with each other's wives, getting drunk cussing, telling dirty jokes, and you think they're real nice professional people. Let me tell you, real nice professional people are not real nice and are not professional. You have to learn that. If the Bible says, learn to believe this, there's none righteous, not one. There's none that understandeth, none that seeketh after God. If the Bible says that, learn to believe it. When I go out in public and I walk into a grocery store i don't see a bunch of righteous people even though a little girl is how are you sir and she's checking me out do i think she's righteous not without christ in her heart and if christ is in her heart she's going to want to be saying something somewhere along the way do i believe all these nice people in america are as nice as they look no the bible says they're not but they say they are so they've even got a lot of people here at grace and truth brainwashed did you know that I've told Dave this. He had a tendency to get angry in public at people. It's, of course, I know he's the only one. Isn't he? Huh? Nobody else gets mad at, in cars and traffic, road rage. But I've told Dave, and I've told others of you, learn to accept what the Bible says about people. I don't mean condemn them. Just accept the fact that if they have no interest in speaking out for the Lord and saying something about truth, you tell them something about truth, okay, thank you, sir. And that's it. If there's an interest, they're elect of God and they're going to want to say something and do something. So I, if I say something, I don't care how small it is, and there's no interest at all, I consider that person mostly evil in their life. I don't believe they're Christians because they go to the Baptist church. Christians take their cross and die daily. Didn't didn't Jesus say that? If you do not bear your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Don't think the world is what they say they are or what they appear to be. They're not. The Bible says that. And you know what this does? It helps you not to be so offended when they do you wrong because when they do you wrong, then you say, well, they're supposed to do that. I'm going to have to watch out for them. You don't go into a rage and go, I'll kill this person because they cheated me. They lied to me. Then you realize, well, they're supposed to do that. I have to watch out for them. God made them vessels of wrath. There's more vessels of wrath. Did you know most people in the United States are going to heaven? If you don't believe that, just ask them. They all think they're going, don't they? They're not. If a person doesn't have Christ in them, if they do not have an inner man and an outer man, the inner man is the new birth, if they don't have that inner man and an outer man wrestling with self, and the outer man is Christ in you, the hope of glory, if they don't have Christ in them, causing them to, uh, causing them to wrestle with sin and with contention and strife and arrogance and pride and the list goes on and on, if they're not fighting self and wrestling with it and they show no interest in it, they're very evil wicked godless people i don't care if it's a little old lady down here at a department store i look at them that way i don't think they're good i have learned to believe the bible that way 
I am more prepared to deal with people. If you, you, if you walk in innocently, innocently into a house and Adolf Hitler and Attila the Hun there waiting to hack your head off, you really are naive. You know, most of the people in the world are naive. Even if there's probably very few people at Grace and Truth that really look at the world the way I look at them. I don't look at them like, like I'm going to get them. I just look at them and think, very wicked. I can walk into the grocery store and look at all the checkers and I think, they're all wicked and evil because I've tried to talk to all of them about truth and they have no interest. Therefore, they're godless. I look at the people in the, the nice guys over there in the, in the produce department and hi there, Mr. Brown. Hi, Pastor Brown. And I've given them DVDs that I can't get a comment out of them. Even if they're told that they should not be saying anything, if they have a real interest, they'd call me. I've given them DVDs. They would call me after work or sometime or they would have an interest of some sort. People that have no interest have no hunger for righteousness and you have to have a hunger for righteousness to be filled. But most of these people have walked an aisle, been dipped in water, and they think, I'm good enough. And they're wicked to the core, if that's what they think. I don't care how sweet the young girl is. I don't care how gentle the old guy is or how gentle the checkout lady is or the person down here at the Dillard's or down at Macy's. It doesn't matter. But you know why people think the way they're thinking? They're brainwashed. Everybody thinks that this is normal. That shows you how, what a bad condition the world is in. They say, God is a good God. How many times has that been said? God is not good to everybody, even my cardiologist. I went in one day and he said, I thought God was benevolent. I said, not to everybody, he's not. Whatever gave you that idea? I know where you got it. You got it from the American way of thinking. My brilliant cardiologist said, I thought God was benevolent. I said, he doesn't love everybody and he's not doing good to everybody. Benevolent is doing good, isn't it? And he said, all things work together for good. For agathos, that's the same thing as being benevolent. Agathos, to them that love God, to them that agape God, to those that walk in the commandments of God, and to them who are the called. And the call, the word called there in Romans 8 and 28, is the word kaleo. To them who are the called. Kaleo, remember, ek kaleo is the word church. Or ekklesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. So all things work together for good to the church or the called out of God. And the called, the ones that walk in God's commandments and they're called of God, all things work together for their benevolence. My doctor said, I said, no, God's not benevolent to everybody. He don't even love everybody. But that's the attitude of the world. Even doctors think God loves everybody. He does not. And he's not good to everybody. People will say, well, God has blessed a man if he's, if he's wealthy and he's got lots of money. No, he, has, he hasn't blessed him. He's given him money that he can't repent of. And he? he's given a self to the man. How hardly, how can you say it is a blessing to have a billion dollars when the Bible says, How hardly shall a rich man enter the kingdom? And even preachers will say a man is blessed. They'll say, they'll say, well, some men are blessed in the flesh, but they're not blessed in eternity. You mean that's a blessing that God has given, given uh, I can't even think of his name, the billionaire. Gates. Gates, Bill Gates. You mean he's giving him $68 billion he can't repent of? And that's a blessing? That's a curse. Mary was talking about some guy that was building a uh, 12,000, he built a 12,000 square foot log house out in somewhere out west and said he, after he lived in it 15 years, he's going to build a bigger one, had these huge rooms and magnificent place. God, I said, I haven't even met the man, but God's going to put that man in hell. People say, how can you say that? How hardly shall a rich man enter? And all the world says, well, if you got things, you're blessed of God. No, you're not. If God gives you great talent, be a great football player, do you think that's a blessing? And you can, and you can sign a $100 million contract for five years like some of those guys do? That's a blessing? 
If that's a blessing, why don't some of those guys with the Titans call me on the TV? Because they see me. You know that a lot of them see. A lot of the stars see. But how are they going to... How are they going to be blessed of God? Because you're blessed when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. When people make you infamous. When they cast out your name as evil. That Jim Brown. That's what they'll say. And they'll ask people, are you still watching that Jim Brown? So I had that put on the back of a shirt, that Jim Brown. And some guy come up to me one day and said, are you that Jim Brown? I said, yeah, that's me. The whole world is deceived. Can't we see it? The Bible says some will depart from the faith. Give, they'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of daemonion. Or our word demon means distribute fortunes. The whole idea of doctrine of the devil is to twist the word of God, leave the word of God in your life, but twist it so you can have what you want. That's the other Jesus. That's Satan disguised as Jesus, transforming himself into an angel of light. The whole world is deceived. If they're not, they're believers, aren't they? Is most of the world believers? No, many are going to go in the broad way that leads to destruction. If believers will come to this place, believers come to the place, recognize the world for what it is. It's a con. The whole thing is a con. Real estate agents are a con. I've been one. I know what they are. Car salesmen are a con. Doctors are a con. I thought doctors will dock you. Well, they will to a degree, but they'll doctor up your bill if they if they can and don't you know that doctors are in with these pharmaceutical companies do you not know that and the people that they prescribe their medications is from a certain company so they can make more money does anybody not know that are people you're not that dumb are you i don't believe you are it's hard for us to face the truth about the con that's being put on us Somebody comes on going, hey, brother, how you doing? Well, it's good to see you. Get away from me. If you can't walk up and say, hey, Jim, what's going on? Don't give me that, man. Hey, I just love you and you are wonderful. Don't give me too much syrup and too much honey. Don't believe it. I'm talking about somebody stroking you to the point you know they're trying to get in your pocket. Salesmen do that. Let me give you some more of these things. God is a good God. Not to everybody, He's not. And do you know America thinks that? They think God loves everybody and He's good to everybody. They think it's the devil causing all these problems. God said, I make peace and create evil. That's a con whenever the... That's part of this brainwashing when people say, God wouldn't create evil, that's the devil. That's another brainwashing technique. That's what Satan did in the garden. He brainwashed Eve. And they say God is good. And he's not to the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, is he? He's not good to the, uh, to the natural brute beasts that were born to be taken and destroyed and they have no other purpose than to be destroyed. He said, even for this same purpose have I raised Pharaoh up that I might show my power in thee. I want to destroy you, Pharaoh. He's not good to Pharaoh. Was he? Let me see here. I've got some other things written down here. They'll say, Jim Brown, you're just bitter and angry. You call people's names. You should never call out anybody's names. That's, that's a brainwashing in America. Don't ever say anything bad about anybody. Well, what about Jesus standing in the middle of the streets of Jerusalem? That's a brainwashing technique. You see, if we can keep everybody smooth and happy looking and put the con on them and make them what was it to uh, i have paper up here something charles manson said oh he said he said i i have i get my people where they don't think they just do what i tell them i tell them not to think i think for them do you know that's what america does you give somebody a track or a DVD and they say, I'll ask my preacher what he thinks about this. Don't they? 
I'll ask my mother what she thinks. And I've gotten to where I tell young people, don't you dare ask your mother and father. They're going to tell you that's not true. And it's as true as you can find. If that's not the truth, then we all don't have any hope. And your mom and daddy probably, probably not going to like it because they're being led away by some preacher. I don't hear anybody that I trust out there in the world to tell the truth. They'll say never call names, and yet Paul said, Hymenes and Philetus preach a doctrine that eats like a canker, and Paul called their names. And then he had it written down in a book in 2 Timothy so that all the people that ever owned a Bible over a 2,000-year period could read their names. He said, Phygelus and Homogenes have done me wrong. He said, Alexander stood against me. Beware of him. Even though Jesus was standing in the streets and called the Pharisees children of hell, he called it Lamas, thou child of the devil. That's what Paul called him. And people say, you should never say things bad about your fellow ministers. Kenneth Copeland is not a minister of God. He is one of Satan's ministers that's transform, transformed himself met the schematizo, disguised himself as a minister of righteousness. Those are not preachers. Get that in your head. If a man's not preaching debt to self, daily cross, self-denial, predestination is true, he's not a minister of God. God knew how to make Jeremiah tell the truth, didn't he? Jeremiah, go out there into the city of Jerusalem and... When you go out there, don't be afraid of the faces of these people standing in the gates of the city. They're going to want to kill you, Jeremiah. Now go do it. And they took Jeremiah and hung him in the mire. The mire was said to be human waste. That was their septic system. They hung Jeremiah in the mire. Now that's Christianity. You want that? That boy, Michael, drew that picture of Jeremiah hanging in the mire on the back. I said, I want a picture of Jeremiah hanging in the mire and say this is where Christianity begins. But everybody's got it in their heads. No, no. The, if the world hates you, I heard some idiot preacher, idiot, and you know who you are. He's pastor of a big Baptist church between here and Gallatin. He said, we can't suffer in America. We're a Christian nation. You numbskull. We are not a Christian nation. This nation is, this is the most wicked evil system that has ever been in the history of the world. It feeds and gluts self, doesn't it? And that's the very message. It has its own name. Let us make us a name which Babylon is built on. And it has the tree of the garden and it advertises the tree of the garden, all that's in the world, advertises in the magazines, on TVs, and tells everybody you can have what you want. So when people desire to have what they want, then they do anything sneaky, underhanded to get it. People don't face the truth. To be objective, you've got to look truth in the eye and say, this is the truth. Whether mama believes it, whether daddy believes it, my kids believe it, I'm going to face the truth. That's the only way you can be objective. Never call anybody's name and point at anyone who calls themselves a Christian. Ignoring Jesus and Paul... And the prophets, Jesus called down the Pharisees. Paul called down Elias. Jesus called the Pharisees generation of vipers, snakes. And he did it out in public. And people say, don't talk about religion in public. And you can't talk about religious here, religion here on this job. And then December comes around, they say, Merry Christmas. Can't talk about Jesus we can say Merry Christmas, don't you dare say anything that he said. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Most of the world believes the world. And I want to get the people at grace and truth, quit believing what the world says and the world thinks. Don't believe the world. You can't believe the world. The world is brainwashed. And you know what? I believe it seeps into the church too. Be phony. Be nice to everyone. No matter what's going on in your life, smile all the time. Pretend like you like everybody. And people will say, don't mothers say to their children, act nice now. What they mean is don't act like you act at home. They're saying act nisquere. It's a French word. Nay means no. Skier means, means knowledge. 
It's our word science. It's our word science or knowledge. So whenever you act nice, you act like you have no knowledge of what's going on. Play dumb and smile all the time. Hi, I'm this way all the time. I'm this way at home with my wife. Let me tell you one th person. Let me tell you something. Those people that are smiley-faced all the time can't fool their wife and kids. You can't fool your spouse, can you? Somebody comes on real nice like hey, they never do anything wrong. I'm just a nice guy. Do I believe Andy Griffith is as nice he looks like on Mayberry or uh, Mayberry with Don Knotts? No, with Barney. No, he's not that nice. There's no such thing as Mayberry. Is there? Nah. If there is, why is it his son didn't talk to him for 11 years, huh? Is anybody as nice? Most people here don't remember Roy Rogers, but he was the king of the cowboys and Mr. Super Nice Guy. And he said one time in an interview, I heard him say, well, some, somebody out there likes me. My life has been charmed my whole life. What he was saying, I've never gone through tribulation. The world loves me and gives me lots of money, and I'm just smoothing my way into heaven. No, he didn't. He did not. Pick out the nicest person you know that all the world likes. Pick out a big personality that everybody likes. Who does the world like? Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. That's right. They like Brad Pitt, but Brad Pitt, if they like Brad Pitt and Brad Pitt likes the world, he's friends of the world, then he's God's enemy, isn't he? Or you can pick out one of these weather personalities or Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey is a moron. Her Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. God loves everybody. He loves homosexuals. He loves Buddhists and Hindus. And yet the Bible says, if anyone comes preaching any of the doctrine, do not bid them Godspeed. Caro, do not be cheerful to them. Because if you do, if you receive them into your house, then you are partaker of their evil deeds and you're being God's enemy. But all the world likes Oprah, don't they? She's a very stupid woman. She's a good business person, but that doesn't mean a thing. She'll go to hell one day. Who else does the world like? Mother Teresa. Huh? Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa had millions of dollars in the bank. Did you know that? Do you know that whenever you win the Nobel Peace Prize, you, they give you a million dollars? She had it in a bank in New York. Mother Teresa was a Roman Catholic. She believed you had to eat the body of Jesus to go to heaven. She wasn't as nice as you think. I read an article, some guys talking about her, and they said she could be real nasty to people. Do I believe a Roman Catholic can be real nasty when they don't believe it's by grace through faith and it's not eating? Oh, yes. I don't mean Mother Teresa was at all what she appeared to be. They never are. See, she thought she was going to put herself in this very austere situation, a very, very self-depriving situation of depriving oneself of all these things, and that's somehow going to get her some publicity, and, and God will look, uh, look upon her, and she won't admit the sinner that she is. No, I believe she went to hell on a sailboat, sailing right in. Do I believe these people are as nice as they appear? No, the Bible says they're not. We're not believing in obedience to God, and you can't, you can't, if she was a full-blown Roman Catholic believing that she had to eat the body of Jesus to go to heaven and that's the only way she could go, that she didn't have to new, be a new creation, she went to hell when she died. We know that Thomas Jefferson wasn't as nice as people think he is. He was a deist. He wasn't a Christian. He said he was a deist. So was George Washington. So was Ben Franklin. The world has been sold a bill of goods. I want the people that grace and truth. The reason I say these things I see the world the way it is. I saw it when I was a kid. I don't know how I could see it, but I didn't know what it was I was seeing. And I'm sure most of you saw it when you were kids because you're elect of God. When you're elect, you're standing back looking at the world going, I don't understand. What is this going on? I can't figure out how to fit in. I'll try to fit in and you keep being cast away. I can't fit in. What's wrong with me? And if something wrong with me? No, there's something wrong with the world. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. You're not of the world. The majority of the people in the world are wrong. That's what we've got to get through our heads. 
Most of the people you see are wrong because most of the people in the world are going to hell. That's what the Bible says. Lord, are there few that be saved? The apostles asked Jesus. He said, strive to enter in the, enter in the straight gate. For many I say and you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. They're trying to go the wrong way through another Jesus, through eating Jesus, through being dipped in water, through being a nice person, through accepting Christ in a sinner's prayer. No new creation. It's not what has happened in your past that makes you a Christian. What are you doing now? Has God changed you? Is He changing you? You can't listen to the world. And you know what? I'm afraid many people here at Grace and Truth are affected by the world's attitudes. It's bleeding into your life. Don't listen to them. Look at things very objective. Stare it straight in the eye and say, it is what it is, and I'm not going to change it by feelings or wanting my mama to be a believer. They'll tell us, never be unhappy. And they'll say, be meek and humble. We need to be meek as Christians. Go around and be a sissy. Be meek. I'm sorry, but meek doesn't mean to be a pansy. It means to be tamed from what you used to be. Praus is the word meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. P-R-A-U-S. It means tame. Why is it you have to be tamed? Because you were wild when you came into the kingdom and you still have a lot of the old nature that God says has to die. So God has to tame you because you still have a lot of your old spirited temper and your rage and you're mad at the world and you want to get them back for what they do to you. He says, I've got to tame you so he gets on top of us like a bucking bronc and rides us into the ground. But the world says, meek, be meek to the world. The Bible's not talking about being meek to the world. When he says, my yoke is easy, the yoke of the kingdom was the laws of a kingdom. You put the yoke on and you pull the plow. The world doesn't know what definition is. They don't know what anything means. When he says, humble yourself under the hand of God. Humble, T-A-P-E-I means to level self. It actually means to level mountains and hills. And the mountain that's in us is Babylon. Babylon is a proud mountain. God says, I'm going to make you a destroying mountain. And I'm going to, he says, you're a destroying mountain. I'm going to make you a burnt mountain. I'm going to level you. When the Bible says that the way is narrow, he says, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And every mountain is going to be brought low and every, every, every low place is going to be leveled up. God says, my road's going to be straight and it's going to be level. And anything that's people who are the low parts, I'm going to raise them up. And the mountains, I'm going to cut them down to the ground. That word humble, and I keep saying, people think humble, they've twisted the meanings, they've perverted the words. They think humble is being humble to one another. The only reason I'll be humble to one of you is because you've got Christ in you. If you didn't have Christ in you, I'm not going to level self in front of you. We level to God. And when you're humble to God, you're obedient to His Word, aren't you? And then you have to find out what all the words mean. You can't be humble to man and God at the same time. When you're humble to God... You'll be bold to man. It don't mean you're going to put people down and be abrasive and sharp and cutting to them, but you are going to come to a place where you're going to be bold. You'll be bold and you'll present the Word of God without a whole lot of humility to a man. If he has Christ in him, when I'm talking to people out in public, if somebody wants to get smart, I say, I'm not talking to you. I'm not going to humble to them. If they have Christ in them, and I can start, and they start receiving the word, I'll get real gentle, real quiet. But I'm not going to stand there and listen to some guy trample the word of God. You don't humble to someone who hates God's word. You don't do that. We've got that twisted, don't we? I'm just, I'm a Christian, and I, I am, I'm not needing, and kind of been over here. Say, I'm a Christian. I'm meek, I'm humble. 
That's not humility. It's being a pansy. We're supposed to be bold to men and humble to God. If we're humble to God, we're going to cut self down and be obedient to his word. Let me read some more things. That I just was sitting thinking about all the things that go on in America. And people twist every word of God. They, Even though the Bible says things, they twist it. They pull out the parts that they want. They pull out the parts that will make life convenient for them. And they'll say, you don't have to work. We're saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Not of works. Don't say you have to have to work or do any. Don't say you have to obey God. I was raised in an independent Baptist preacher's home. He says, we don't talk about works. And his preacher friends, works are no part of this. Yes, they are. So you have to sit and evaluate. What does it mean? It says, faith is not of works. Faith is the gift of God. He has to put it in your heart. And then when you believe God, then you start obeying Him because faith cometh by hearing and hear obey are the same word. And believe is the verb form of faith, so if you believe God, you're obedient to Him. This is not what... All these Baptist eyes around, they twisted that and say it's not of works. Faith without works is a dead faith. A car without a motor is a dead car, isn't it? We have been hoodooed. The whole nation is hoodooed. The preachers are hoodooing the people. Christianity is nice, and it kind of skipped to the tulips. Isn't that what they think it is? It's, it's something for pansies and sissies. No, it's not. Not true Christianity is not. Please, grace and truth, people, don't listen to the world. Don't think you're seeing something because you look at something and it looks nice. It's not. It acts nice. Something's nice is something that has no knowledge. But people are... Pre Do you not know that people are pretending that they're dumb? They do that everywhere all the time. They're playing dumb. I don't believe the world is as stupid as they act. They've, they've, sold a lot. they've sold some people at grace and truth. But then I'm not fooled by them. It took me a long time to see that. From study, if you study the Word of God constantly, you'll start saying, oh my God, the world is, boy, they're messed up. Don't let it affect your life by believing all that stuff, that nicey, nice, happy, happy Jesus time. A yeah, a form of godliness. But denying the power thereof. When you get to where you don't, you don't have to distrust the world. Sometimes you have to learn to lay your feelings out there. And if somebody wants to jump up and down on them, let them. And then pick them up and wrap them up and go your way. You can't sit around afraid to let your feelings out there. I, let my, I lay my feelings out to people all the time. Some people disappoint me. Some people hurt me. And I learn just to back away and go on my way. And that don't mean I'm not ever going to be around them again. I watch them until I see whether they really repented or not. Do I trust that people at Grace and Truth have it together? No, I don't believe that. But you know what? Since I believe that, it gives me more patience for you when I realize you don't have it together. If you think somebody has it together, you have no patience with them. You understand what I'm saying? If you know they don't and they're not supposed to until they grow up spiritually, then you're more compassionate. You say, well, maybe their upbringing, maybe their environment, maybe their situation, maybe they're having a hard time, maybe they're not making a living, maybe they're upset because they can't pay the rent or the house payment. Maybe it's something like this. You cut some slack for people when you realize that's the way people are. That's what you're supposed to do as a believer. And I'm not talking about cutting slack for the world out here. I'm talking about for each other. Because everybody's not at the same growth position. Let me read some more of this that I've got written down here. All the world says, never be unhappy. The Bible says, blessed are the meek and the poor in spirit. Be meek and humble and gentle all the time. Be a sissy. That's what the world thinks a Christian is, isn't it? This is brainwashing. Get along with everybody. Get along and like everybody. Isn't that what they say? Love your family. And yet Jesus said, 
When you come into truth, a man's foes will be those of his own household. That's all brainwashing. They've taken the word of God and thrown it out, pulled out some verses they like. Look, love your neighbor. Here's one. Love God. Love Jesus. Love each other. Don't worry about what love means. Just do it. How can you do it if you don't know what it means? And you substitute another word in there, another meaning in there. That's why the world is in such a mess. America's not Christian. America's going after the tree, aren't they? Aren't they going after all that's in the world, all the advertising? Don't you believe, don't you believe that they put TV shows on so you can have an entertaining movie to watch? That's not why they put it on there. They put it on there to sell. Don't you think that they put the Super Bowl on there just so everybody can watch the Super Bowl. No. It costs $10 million for one little 30-second ad. That's why they do it. To make hundreds of millions, billions of dollars for that hour and a half they're on there. And they go on these commercials. And if you're going to buy a 30-second commercial, it would be about $10 million. Maybe 20 That's what it's for. It's not so you can enjoy the TV program. None of those programs are so you can watch an old movie like Gone with the Wind. They don't care whether you ever watch Gone with the Wind or not. They want to put commercials on there so you will buy something. That's all it's about. And people will say you don't have to obey God. You don't have to be righteous. Just accept Christ and pray this prayer. And they'll pull the verse out. See, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All you have to do is pray this sinner's prayer and you're, you're home free. But the next verse is, how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And belief is obedience. It could say, how shall they call on him in whom they've not obeyed? You can't, God doesn't hear a sinner who's rebellious against him. We know that God heareth not sinners. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him heareth. You've got to be worshiping God and doing the will of God in order for him to listen to your prayer. Besides that, prayer means to bow to the will of God. How can you bow to the will of God if you're an unregenerate sinner? You can't, can you? Don't believe the world. The world lies. The world lies, then twists the lie to where it looks okay. Then mix a little truth in with it, and they say, You see, I'm a Christian. I go to church. Therefore, I can do this little thing that God don't mind that I do. I can drink a little social drinking, and I can do a little cussing. I can say, damn it, hell here and there. No, you can't. The only reason people will curse because their temper flares up and they'll let loose of a damn or a hell or a... You're not supposed to be doing that as a believer. Our mouths need to be cleaned up. That's the hard... That's the hardest thing for us to clean up because that happened, boom, all of a sudden, doesn't it? You need to... Yeah, nobody cussed like I used to. I used to cuss the blue streak while I was in real estate, especially when I was in music business. We're not to be cursing and being a bad representative of God's people. Once you cuss in front of somebody, I don't care how light the word is, a damn or a hell... See, that seems to be the easiest words to say, isn't it? Oh, there's certain words, there's certain curse, curse words that we as Christians won't say, right? Well, there's certain curse words that are the lesser of two evils, so I'll say the lesser curse word, right? We need to clean our lives up completely. Don't listen to the world. See what else I got on here. The world is brainwashed. Be sure and go vote for the most popular Christian candidate. That's an oxymoron, isn't it? That's an ox and a moron is what it is. <coughs> vote for the lesser of two evils. Vote for the most acceptable sin. That's the world's idea. And you have no right... To complain if you don't vote. Yes, you do. I'm not going to vote for a rattlesnake and a cobra. I'm not going to vote for either one of them. Paul said, what have I to do to judge those who are outside the church? 
Look at that over in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 5. I'm always saying that, but I want you to see it. Look here in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. And he's talking about a man that's having an affair with his stepmother. He says, don't fellowship with this guy. Don't keep company with him. In verse 9, yet the world will say, if somebody's in the church and he's a Christian too, he's just having a hard time. We need to go love him. We need to show affection for him. No, we don't. That's another brainwashing attitude in America. The Bible doesn't say that. The man's having an affair with his stepmother. Paul says, Turn that guy away from the church. Get him out of the church. Tell him, look, if you're going to live rebelliously and sleep with this woman that's your stepmother and you come to church, you're leaven in the church and you're going to leaven the whole church because people are going to be looking at you and say, if it's okay, if he sleeps around, I get to sleep around. If he drinks a little, I get to drink a little. And what you're doing is being a bad testimony. But the world says we're supposed to go hug them and tell them how much we love them and how God loves them too. Don't do that. Well, that's being mean. Let them interpret it however they want to. The Lord says withdraw from them. Stay away from them. You can't live the way you want. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You say, are you forbidding me to live the way? No, I'm not forbidding you. God is. Well, I'll just keep doing it. But then he's going to beat the tar out of you. Well, I can handle a headache for two weeks. It ain't going to be a headache for two weeks. It's going to be 20 years of him picking you up by your hind legs and banging you up and down on the, on the floor. He's going to break you, put you through a divorce, take your car away, take your house away, take your job away, make you 50 years old with nothing left to your name. He says, you give up? That's what he'll do. What he does to his children, he says, I scourge every son I receive. The scourge was the mastix or the mastigao. That's the Roman flagellum. It was a bloody beating, ripping the hide off down to the... You can see the insides pulsating. He says, I beat my children mercifully. Not, not mercilessly. If you think you like to be beaten by God, you're really mistaken. God picked me up and beat me for about 25 years until I just said, okay, God, I give up, threw my hands in the air and said, I surrender. And then whenever I'd get into sin after that, I'd go, oh, God, what am I doing? See, once you begin to surrender to God, when you get into any kind of sin, especially planned sin, you drop your head and say, oh, Lord. But before God really severely deals with you, you have a tendency to say, well, we can all sleep around. We're all whoremongers. We're all sinners. Has anybody been guilty there? No, you can't. You can't live the way you want. I'm not telling you that. God's telling you that. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to Him. You have to learn to quit listening to the world. Do you know a whole lot of people here at Grace and Truth listen to the world's attitudes? It creeps into your life and you think you actually believe what they look like and what they say. I never do. I feel like I'm in a room full of strangers when I'm at the grocery store. I don't care how young the girls' checkers are or how old the little old ladies are. I feel like I'm in a world of strangers because I probably am. As much as I've talked to those people and not one of them, well, there is one that talks to me and he has some conviction. But the rest of them, one of them will be over there in produce. Hi there, sir. How are you? I'm doing fine. Did you ever listen to that DVD I gave you? Yeah, I looked at it and it was interesting. Back to work. No conviction enough to do something in their life about it. I'm not saying they won't, but I don't believe you can watch this message and not be convicted by it if you're elect. I just don't believe the world is as nice as they look. You say, Jim, you're bitter. Well, certainly I am. I'm bitter towards sin. I'm bitter towards people who don't believe God. I'm supposed to be bitter. You're supposed to be not bitter towards the people of God. I love the sheep. I'm bitter towards anything that tries to hurt the sheep. This brainwashing technique that goes on in the world, it gets in and creeps into all believers' lives. Did you know that? If you're not real strong, it creeps in when you don't even know it's creeping in.
Jesus says to give Caesar what he requires and nothing more. Pay your taxes and don't break his laws. He's not saying make sure you vote for the right Caesar. There's no good Caesars. If they're friends with the world, they're popular with the world, they're God's enemies. Isn't that what the Bible says? That's what it says. America has twisted everything. It's twisted the Bible. It's twisted business. It's twisted politics. Do I believe anything is righteous in America? No, I don't. Except God's people, and that's all. I believe we're being fooled by a nation that goes after stuff and things, and they'll cheat and lie their brains out. Well, we're a Christian nation. That's why God's blessed us. God has given us so much money we can't repent of it. We've never seen such a decadent lifestyle in the history of the world as we have here. Have we? The world is dying and starving, and we're saying, God's blessed us. We don't care. America doesn't care about the poor and the downtrodden. They care about the uplifted, the person that's winning the game. We want somebody tough like the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Dallas Cowboys. I got you. We want our team to win. We don't care about the losers. What does the Bible say about the losers? You go lift them up. You don't lift up the winners. They've got enough glory. They're the comely parts of America. The losers are the downtrodden. But nobody says, we lost, we won the game. Let's go find the downtrodden and pick them up. You ever seen anybody do that? They don't. I have a heart for the poor and the needy and the downtrodden. I don't care about somebody getting the, getting the loving cup or the winner's award. Brainwashing is forgetting the true meanings and twisting them and repeating them over and over till it becomes acceptable in America. That's what's going on in America. And it actually creeps into the true church of the Lord. Some of it creeps into grace and truth into our lives, doesn't it? If we can face the world for what it is, life actually is more acceptable. Did you know that? If you actually think these people are as nice as they act, they're going to disappoint you and they're going to lie to you and steal from you. And then you're going to say, I want to. and then you get a little worldly yourself because you haven't really faced the fact about it. It's become acceptable in America. It's become a brainwashing thing to laugh at adulterers and applaud homosexuals, isn't it? Hey, you've come out of the closet. Yay! One day on, what's that goofy woman with the blue eyes? Ellen the the degenerate. <laughs> yeah, she. the woman is sleaze. She said, and so-and-so is coming out of the closet today. And the, and the whole crowd went, yay! That's insane, isn't it? And she has her audience brainwashed. And we're going to applaud the homosexual. And so-and-so is going to come out of the closet today. He's robbed brakes. Yay! Good night. And we'd like to applaud so-and-so who had an affair on his wife. Yay! Isn't that nuts? Let's applaud sin. Let's call good evil and evil good. Let's put sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. That's what Isaiah said the world is going to do. There's a famine in the land. Amos said in the 8th chapter, he said there's a famine, but it's not a famine of water and bread. It's a famine of the Word of God, and we're living in it. I believe the time will come when euthanasia will be acceptable on a certain set of old people who are no longer profitable to society, it's time to put your mother to death. She just wang on society. Said enough, and it becomes normal behavior, doesn't it? Christianity, I put down here, is a miserable, happy life. It's un we're unhappy because we see the world thumbing their nose at God. We're happy because we have the truth and we have one another and we, and we rejoice in the Lord. When the Bible says rejoice in the Lord and the power of his might, rejoice, and I say rejoice, rejoice in the Greek is that word kara. It says rejoice in the Lord and the Bible says charity 
rejoiceth not with iniquity in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Charity rejoiceth not with evil people. Charity rejoices. Paul told, Paul told the Philippians, you are my joy. Rejoice and joy are the same word, kara. Comes from the word charis, which is the word grace. Well, people say we're to be happy and we're to go around people that, well, after all, they may be heathens and they may do Christmas and they may cuss and tell dirty jokes. We're supposed to go embrace them, tell them how much we love them, and we'll step away while they're cussing, but we can go to the family gatherings and when brother-in-law's cussing and getting drunk, we just need to love him. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's a brainwashing that's going on in America. How much time do I have, Mike? All right. Brainwashing is repeating it over and over till it becomes unquestionable. It becomes an unquestionable paradigm. You know what a paradigm is? It's what, the, what is common among the people, what everybody believes. They'll say it over and over and over till... Have you noticed how many things we've said tonight actually has crept into your mind, into the church? You've got to look at things strictly from a biblical viewpoint and ignore what your mother says, and ignore what your friends say, and ignore what you think you see with your eyes. The Bible teaches that nobody's good, and if a person doesn't have Christ in him, he has no conscience. Conscience is the word sunitesis. Sun, E-I-D-E-S-I-S. And sunitesis has to do with our testimony. When the Bible speaks of, over there in, in Romans... The ninth chapter, we're not going to talk about predestination, but we're going to talk about something else in Romans. Romans, the ninth chapter. Evil people don't have a conscience. I don't care if it's a sweet little checker girl down at, down at the supermarket. If she's checking out and she thinks that because she, she got dipped in water at the Church of Christ, she's going to heaven. She's a very wicked person. If, she doesn't, if she's not a new creation in Christ and God is not causing her to, to be obedient to his word, take her cross and die daily, Jesus said, without a daily cross, you're not a disciple of mine. You're not a learner of mine. You're not a follower of me. You can't obey me without a daily cross. If people think they got dipped in water, they accepted Christ and prayed a sinner's prayer, they have very wicked hearts if they don't believe that they have to change God has to change them into new creatures, somebody that the old person wouldn't recognize. I'm not saying young girls are going to grow up real fast. I'm saying our young boys that work in stores. But if they are completely uninterested, if God doesn't make them interested somewhere along the way where the old person wants to die out and give up to Christ, I don't care how many times they were dipped in water or walked down an aisle, that doesn't mean anything. This thing about salvation is a serious thing with God. Look here in He's saying here in verse 1 of chapter 9 of Romans I say the truth in Christ I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit bearing witness bear witness is the word sum M-A-R-T-U-R-E-O. It means to be martyred with. Sunitis means to see with. The inner man is going to make the outer man die. That's going to make him a martyr after years of trial and fire. And the man is going to learn to die. And we're going to see with Christ the inner man. And conscious means to see with or to die with. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. If you don't have Christ in you, you can't see with Him. And you can't die with Him. The inner man insists that the outer man die, and that's martyrdom, and that's being a witness, and we have to die with Christ, who's the inner man, and what gives us good conscience is a testimony, is seeing with Christ. If a person has the inner man, the outer man is going to start dying a little at a time over the years. If there's no dying, the person has no conscience. I don't care how innocent they look. 
There's no dying somewhere along the way. They have no conscience. And I've gone, I've preached messages on conscience. If you think these people out here have a conscience, will they feel guilty? No, they don't. Not, they don't have true godly sorrow that worketh repentance. It's godly sorrow. They may be sorry they got caught doing something, but they're not sorry. They're just sorry they got caught. People are going to be sorry when a guy's looking out of the bars and he's crying. He's, he's sorry he got caught. When people have got a hold of the bars of hell, they're crying, Oh God, why'd you put me here? It's all about me. They're not really truly sorry. These people in the world that have no inner man, if they have any inner man, they're going to start dealing with all these sins of, of contention and strife and pride and self. If they don't deal with that somewhere along the way, they don't know God and they have no conscience. To have a conscience, you have to have an inner man that was birthed there by the will of God. And people will say, some of the common things they say, you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion in public. Where in the world did you get that? That's what I always ask people. Well, I know where they got it. America's been brainwashed with that. I can talk about what I want to in public. If you can't talk about it in public, you won't be martyred, will you? That's one of the stupidest brainwashing techniques they have put up on the American public. Don't talk about politics and religion in public. I say, who said so? You? Watch this. <laughs> what, a, what a dumb statement to make. Everyone has a right to their opinion. That's your opinion. I give you the meaning of the word prayer prosukamai means to bow to the will of God. And Jesus said we're to pray thy will be done. And he prayed the night before he died thy will be done. What do you mean that's an opinion? Everybody doesn't have their right to their opinion. The Bible says there's no prophecy of scripture of any private interpretation. The word private is the word idios. It means, idios means self-interpretation. There's no prophecy of Scripture that you can interpret for your own. It means of one's own self. Then, there is no specifics in brainwashing. They just spread everything out over the public and there's no definition in it. There's no specific meaning to anything. Nothing is defined. Just use the word that's convenient to smooth things over. That's what people do, isn't it? They'll say a woman has a right to her own body and that she can abort a baby if she wants to. It amazes me that you can watch some... You watch the ID channel, uh, Investigative Discovery... These people are killing each other all day long. And if a baby is killed while the woman is still pregnant, they'll try the person for murder for the baby. But the law says it's not a baby. It's crazy. They'll try, they'll, I've seen them try guys for murder, and they'll get the death penalty for killing that baby that's still in the belly of the woman. But they say that's not a baby. It's just a fetus. You guys got a double standard, don't you? Cussing and using filthy language is normal in public and on TV. And that's normal, right, Jim? Don't hold that against them. Well, God will hold it against you. Cussing is not normal to the believer's life. First of all, it's a bad testimony, isn't it? And the public says morality is something each individual has a right to judge for themselves. What do you ever come up with that? That's not what the Bible says. You can't judge for yourself. You have to judge righteous judgment. And morality is something that God lays down, not man. Everybody lies, therefore it's no big deal to lie. Yes, it is. The hardest thing to do is learn to say yea, yea, and nay, nay, not polish things up and make yourself look good. The reason man don't want to admit he lies is because he doesn't want to look bad in the eyes of people. 
But it's got to be standard thing for people to lie. I had a lady come in here one time. She said, it's normal for, to, for kids to teach other, each other to lie. Lie until you get caught. She said, teenagers do that now. Don't you know that? I said, I didn't know that. They say, lie until you get caught. And they'll tell each other to do that. And you'll hear this. Whenever you talk about living righteous and godly, people say, nobody can live perfect. That's an excuse to sin is what it is. Don't listen to that. The Bible says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Perfect is the word teleos. It means to be completed and mature. Grow up and mature. Grow up and be what you're supposed to be as a, as a man and as a woman. Clean your life up. Clean your mouth up. Clean your actions up. Jim, that sounds awful boring. Well, it sounded boring to me when I was young. But I found out it's the only way to live and it's the only way to keep, keep on God's side. I started to say keep God on your side. It's the only way to stay on God's side. When you get off, when you get off of God's side, he's at war with you, isn't he? He resists the proud. He's at war with those who shine above others with their opinion. Those who are brainwashed. Men's minds have been manipulated by our society and system. Don't let it creep into your life. Look at the world and whatever they're doing, go do the opposite. And then you can find the truth that way. Right? What's highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. And the most mid misquoted verse in all the Bible in our society, what is it? No, I want somebody to tell me what it is. <laughs> what do we say? What do people say all the time? Judge not. The Bible doesn't even say don't judge. It says you. And this is, and everybody thinks the Bible says judge not. And I'll say, no, it doesn't say that. And they'll say, yes, it does. And I'll say, no, it doesn't say that. They'll say, yes, it does. I say, Where? And nobody ever knows where it is. And usually I'll say, you think it's in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse one. By the time you say that, they get real nervous. They think you may know something about it, and I do. <laughs> and it's when you have a sentence that starts with a verb, there's an understood subject. You judge not. that ye be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and what measure you meet, it'll be measured to you again. So first of all, get the beam out of your own eye so you can see clearly to judge righteously and get the mote out of your brother's eye. First of all, you've got to clear up your seeing. Remember, idolatry means to serve what you see. E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. Idolatry comes from ido, meaning to see, and latruo, meaning to serve. It means to serve what you see. If you've got idols in your eye, you cannot judge righteously because you have opinions roaming around all in your head. You've got to clear up your vision, get rid of your opinions, get rid of your idolatry that's in your eye, and then you can see clearly to judge properly. Besides that, over in John... 724, the Bible says, look not at the outward appearance. Don't look at something because she's pretty, he's handsome, they're glib, they're popular, she's funny, he's funny. Don't look at the outward appearance. That's what the world does. They're brainwashed by looking at people that are popular and they say, oh, well, I just love him, don't you? I just love her. I don't like them because they're not popular and they're overweight and they got... Uh, they got pimples and they got, they got moles all over their face. I, I can't love them. The Bible says that's judging unrighteously. That's the whole world. That's a brainwashing that's going on, isn't it? And you can't hardly even comment back to somebody when they say, Judge not. The Bible says, Judge not. No, it doesn't. It says, Clear your vision up so you can see to judge righteously. Look not at the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And that's just another brainwashing that's in the world. Judge not. You can try to explain it to them. They don't even want to listen to that, do they? 
we need to clean our lives up and don't listen to the world. And I got a few more of these, but I'm out of time. Don't listen to these motivational speakers. You can be great like me, like Tony Robbins. Don't listen to that. That's a con. Most people don't know that's a con. Businessmen who have a lot of get up and go and a lot of self-start, they'll go listen to it. They'll get wound up a little more. But usually the only people that Tony Robbins will affect is the person that's got it in them to do that. Everybody doesn't have it in them to be super salesmen. Don't listen to that. It's a con. If you noticed, he kind of died and gone away, hadn't he? What happened? Maybe the American public caught on, you reckon? Nobody gets... I have never met anybody got rich going to a Tony Robbins concert, and that's all it is, is a concert. I have gone to real estate concerts and listened to motivational speakers feed out a bunch of baloney. Everybody here can be great like me. Yeah, everybody in there, the little quiet school teacher types, can be great like you. You liar. Don't, that is misleading people. When people put this con on the American public, don't believe it. If it's not reality, it's not real. Is it? We live in a real world. But they all got themselves convinced that the presidents are going to uh, fix it, aren't they? You can't fix $222 trillion. You can't con yourself into that. You can't even fix $16 trillion, which is what they say we owe. We couldn't pay $16 trillion off for the next 500 years. Not at the rate we're going. America's being gone. Don't believe it. I'm telling the sheep, don't believe everything. Don't believe most of what you see and most of what you hear. They say don't believe half of what you see and half of what you hear. Don't hardly believe any of it. Because what you see is deceiving. Nicey, nice people are very deceptive. I'm not saying go out and mistreat people. Just don't believe it. The Bible says don't believe it. Most of the people in the world are going to hell. Most of the nice, sweet, soft-spoken people that you know that don't ever talk about the Bible are going to hell. Most of the people you work with are going to hell. Most school teachers are going to hell. Most people that work at Lowe's and at that place you work at are going to hell. <laughs> They're, most of them are going to hell. That's what the Bible says. The majority of the world's going to hell. Why do you put so much faith in them? They want to be slushy, nice, and syrup dripping all over the place, and honey, well, just, hey, I, I just, isn't life wonderful? Oh, go away. It's wonderful in Christ, but there's nothing wonderful outside of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth. God, help the church to understand that we're under an assault by false doctrine and by this depravity in the world and by all this niceness, this apostasy. Lord, help us to understand that apostasy comes dressed up in a nice outfit and a nice garb. That's why it would deceive the very elect if it were possible. Thank you for those words. Help us to face the truth the way it is. Lord, that's what will make us stronger is looking at the world through biblical eyeglasses, Lord. Cause to continue this work, open up many doors for the ministry, and Lord, I'll say these truths. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen.